so so what happens is there is a big role of surface ecg for such kind of patients and why i'm telling you there is a big role is whenever these patients will be coming you will be doing those routine ecgs but the routine ecgs are not just simply like this okay so what happens is you try to you try to see them in fact and what is the what is the interference are you able to see so for example what is happening in this ecg so the confusion what happens is it a lv only pacing or is it a biventricular pacing so how will you say about it so what happens is if you look carefully the ecg during biventricular pacing with the rv lead at the apex okay because there is a dominant r in v1 and this is a right superior axis in the frontal plane and the qrs complex is relatively more narrow so i'll tell you like so this is 170 milliseconds in fact when compared to the single rv or lv pacing okay so what is happening over here so here you see is a mono chamber lv pacing from the coronary venous system why is it because you see there is a typical right bundle branch block pattern and right axis deviation and if you look carefully there is a dominant r wave from v1 to v6 which is consistent with the basal lv pacing and the lv pacing is shown in all the subsequent figures was performed from the coronary venous system so from the coronary sinus and now what is happening in this ecg again this is a so again this is a 12 lead ecg right but the pacing is done from the rv outflow why because you see left inferior you know axis and there is left bundle branch block and of course there is no dominant r wave in the v1 so now what do you notice in this ecg So in this, you see the ventricular fusion of pacemaker-induced ventricular depolarization with the native QRS complex generated by the spontaneous AV conduction, and the fusion QRS complex is narrow. And you also notice that the QR complex in lead two, three AVF and five six, in fact, and the pattern tends to simulate. The myocardial infarction during the triple D pacing is ASV pace. So, in a patient which was there for the six sinus syndrome, and in fact, you also notice there is relatively normal AV conduction and no evidence of coronary artery disease. Okay. So, what is happening in this ECG? So, this is an interesting patient. the dual chamber pacemaker for the six sinus syndrome and 3 years after the pacemaker implantation he presented with tia and the ecg which was taken when the pacemaker was programmed to vvi mode showed ventricular pace beats with a dominant r from v1 to v3 and the right axis deviation there was also ventricular fusion beats in v4 to v6 isn't it and then a tu was performed which showed the ventricular lead in the it has passed from the ra to the la and it crossed into the mitral valve so it was a emergency procedure so finally the lead was extracted percutaneously without any complications to prevent any embolization so you need to be careful so ECGs will tell you such a deep, deep story. This is an ECG is not just a simple ECG. Okay, so what is happening in this? So this is a biventricular pacing with the RV lead at the apex, and what do you notice? The V1. There's dominant R wave, and a right superior axis in the frontal plane, and the in fact the QRS complex is relatively more narrow, which is of nearly. One for seventy milliseconds, 
than the single chamber RV or LV pacing. So what do you notice over here? So you notice this is the biventricular pacing. Okay, to the biventricular to RV pacing in lead one. Similarly, biventricular to LV pacing in lead three over here. So one of the important things is, is like you need to be very careful is uh, the QRS vector can in fact change how it is being paced in the sense this is the mean QRS vector okay what do you notice over here however in the ECG principle wise if you notice so you will get a positive wave when a depolarization front is coming towards it. Okay, and if you get a negative wave when the depolarization is moving away, so this is how do you notice? Okay, negative to positive. So always remember our Eindhoven triangle. So what is happening over here is the lead one, lead two, and the lead three. And the surface ECG leads you all will always remember V1 to V6, how it is placed, the AVL, AVR. And the AVF. So this is the normal sinus rhythm. So the RV, the direction depolarization vector is like this. The LV is of course towards the opposite and slightly inferior, but by ventricular it goes above like this. So what is happening is if there is an unpaced, so the sinus node will be taking care. So that's why it is going like this. However, when the LV pacing which is indicative for the CRT, or simultaneous independent outputs or unipolar LV lead. Okay, and the CRT is simultaneous independent outputs. So this is how it goes. Similarly, for the RV pacing, it goes in a direction like this. So CRT simultaneous independent outputs, unipolar LV leads. So how do you see for the diagnosis for the CRT malfunction? You try to see is RV apical pacing goes like this, the Y ventricular pacing is like this, and the RV outflow track direction will be having an axis like this. So that's why by looking at the axis, you will be able to see. For example, let me try to give you an example. What is happening over here? So you already can notice how the axis tends to go. Okay, over here. So the mean axis is going upward and straight. So now, this is a very interesting diagram. In the sense, you can see the 12 lead ECG, especially during the apical RV pacing. This is a very important diagram you should not try to forget. In the sense, so what is happening is how the a typical left bundle branch block pattern in the left precordial leads may not be present and all leads show the QS pattern. And this is what is happening over here. What is happening is the ECG QRS pattern during the RV pacing, in fact. So during the RV apical pacing, this is how it tends to change, in fact. So what is happening over here? So what is happening over here is, if you look carefully, this is during the RV outflow track. And the frontal plane axis points to the left inferior quadrant and there is a left bundle branch block pattern in the precordial leads because there is no dominant R wave in the lead one, V1. So you can already notice the difference between the QS and the QR wave. So this is the same patient, okay, uh, which we saw earlier with a lateral chest X-ray and which the lead was displaced. So I think we already said it, said about it. Is what is happening is we can see the ventricular fusion of the pacemaker induced ventricular depolarization with the native QRS complex generated by spontaneous atrioventricular conduction. And the fusion QRS is narrow. Note the QR complex in the two inferior and the V5, V6, which I already said it. And the pattern tends to simulate the myocardial infarction. 
although it is happening during the DDT pacing, in fact, only during the six sinus syndrome, relatively normal AV conduction and no evidence of coronary artery disease. In fact, so that is what does. Mm -hmm. So, let me try to show you. So, what do we notice over here? We are noticing is the evaluation of a dominant R wave in V1 during the uncomplicated R wave pacing. When there is a dominant R wave occurs, when V1 is recorded, one or two intercostal spaces too high. A negative QRS complex will often be recorded in the fourth intercostal space, which is correct for the V1. So, if the dominant R wave persists or is initially recorded in the fourth intercostal space, a negative QRS complex will be recorded one intercostal space in the fifth intercostal space. Okay. So what is happening over here? So yes, this is the uncomplicated RV PC. In the figure A, you see is the lead one V1 shows dominant R wave in third and fourth intercostal space. But a negative QRS complex is recorded one space lower in the fifth intercostal space. Similarly, the dominant R wave in lead V1 ECG when the leads V1 and V2 are recorded in the second intercostal space, the dominant R wave in V1 disappears when the V1 and V2 are recorded in the fourth intercostal space, isn't it? Similarly, so what is happening is the figure C is showing this tall R wave recorded in lead V1 when placed too high. And of course, which tends to disappear when the V1 was recorded in the correct fourth intercostal space. So, what is happening over here? So, we all does anyone remember? We had already spoken about it, all right. So, this was the patient with dual chamber for six sinus syndrome, but this guy d developed a TIA. And okay, so what had happened is uh, they, when the ECG was taken, so it was programmed to VVI mode, and then uh, it was seen that there is a dominant R wave in V1 to, to V3 with right axis deviation and ventricular fusion beats in V4 to V6. But yes, when a T was done, then lead perforation was seen, and then of course it was managed later on. So an important question is, what are the causes of dominant R wave in V1 during the conventional ventricular pacing? It may happen due to ventricular fusion or pacing in the myocardial relative refractory period or the LV pacing from the coronary venous system or the left ventricular endocardial or epicardial pacing or even the lead perforation of the RV and septum. Similarly, if there is a com uncomplicated RV pacing as well. So what is happening during the LV pacing? So if you are pacing from the LV, there will be a positive AVR and V1. Similarly, there will be a negative 1, 2 and three can be biphasic. So you have you should try to think it like this. If there is an LV pacing, the propagation is going to be like this. So if it is going to be propagation is going to be like this, so of course one and two will be negative hmm? and AVR will be positive. Okay. Right? And three can be bi biphasic. So this is the same thing which is happening during the LV pacing, as you already spoke about it. However, if there is a biventricular pacing happening, so during the biventricular pacing, what do you notice? So during the biventricular, because it is RV and LV both, so it is going to make a right superior axis because of the fusion of the RV and LV electrical axis. 
and a QR, small QR or capital QR complex in lead one may be seen rarely. Okay. And in biventricular places, of course, there is loss of the Q, smaller the big Q in the lead one. So it is a hundred percent predictive of the loss of LV capture. So that's why in either LV or biventricular pacers, patient from middle cardiac vein or the anterior cardiac vein may cause left bundle branch block. So this was a study what is called as Vigor CHF, which showed the, how the uh, relationship between the biventricular RV and the LV axis and their distribution in fact. So yes, uh, if you really want to monitor the changes, you should always try to look in the lead 1 and lead 3. Okay, And then you try to notice in the electrical waveforms and also the ECG morphology. Yeah. So always remember one thing is there if you come across loss of capture, so what do you think? So, so from the biventricular to the RV, try to think for the changes in the morphology will be as if one was like this, so it becomes tends to become predominantly positive if there is only RV is happening. Similarly, from the biventricular to only LV. It will be, of course, opposite, right? So what is happening is biventricular to RV, when it is going to happen is, so in the lead 1, you will be seeing there is greater positivity. However, in lead 3, it will be more of negativity. And the axis is going to shift clockwise. And the same thing is going to happen opposite when the biventricular changes into left ventricular. Okay, so whenever those patients are coming to you, you should try to keep on seeing the axis change, how the is it uh, varying between, you know, and try to do the threshold testing as well. So, so what do you notice in this ECG? Anyone would like to try? We have already spoken about such ECGs, right? So again, this is a 12 lead ECG. And why this is like a monochamber LV pacing, but from the coronary venous uh, coronary sinus, in fact. And there's typical right bundle branch block pattern and right axis deviation. So that's why I notice the dominant R wave from the V1 to V6 which is consistent with the basal LV pacing. And LV pacing is shown in all the subsequent figures performed from the CS system, in fact. So what is happening in this ECG now? So there is A and B. So in the A, what you notice is during the LV pacing with lead V1 and V2 recorded at the level of second intercostal space, but it is a thin patient with elongated chest during the LV pacing and that is why they, you don't see any dominant R wave in the V1. And in fact, the biventricular pacing also fails to show a dominant R wave in the V1 at the level of second intercostal space. So then this another ECG was done. So in fact, here the dominant R wave in V1 becomes evident only when the lead V1 is recorded in the fourth intercostal space. And the R wave in V1 recorded in the fourth intercostal space during biventricular pacing also became dominant. So what is happening here? You tend to do the increase the output, uh, decrease the output and that is the reason there is loss of LV capture and that is why you start seeing changes in the 
polarity of lead 1 and 3. And when you do increase the output, you notice there is LV capture. So this we had already discussed. So this is the usual direction of the mean frontal plane axis during the apical RV pacing, RV outflow pacing, and LV pacing from the coronary sinus venous system, and the biventricular pacing from the with LV from coronary sinus and RV from the apex. So the axis during biventricular pacing from the LV from the coronary sinus plus RV outflow tract usually points to the right inferior quadrant that is the right axis as with monochamber LV pacing okay so what is happening interestingly in this ECG is there is already biventricular pacing going on where the RV lead is at the apex but we notice there is a dominant R wave in V1 and the right superior axis in the frontal plane so the QRS complex is relatively more narrow, like 170 milliseconds, than the during the single chamber RV or LV pacing, in fact. So if you would like to really summarize all these changes, what is happening is to try to remember if there is a RV apical pacing, you will notice LVVB, and there will be upper left axis. Similarly, if RVOT pacing will be there, left bundle branch block you will see and there is a normal axis. Similarly, if LV apical pacing will be there, you will notice RVVB and right axis. If there is a bite ventricular pacing, still you will predominantly see is right bundle branch block with upper right axis. And however, the bi ventricular goes into RV, then the lead one will become more positive. Okay, try to remember the axis, the Eindhoven triangle, because that is one of the keys which will help you understand the concept rather than just remembering. Similarly, if the Y ventricular to LV it goes, so the lead 3 tends to become more positive. So, we all are aware that some devices are designated actually to pace mostly in the uh, LV only. So there are some newer concepts as well which is being tried and in fact uh, they are trying to show for the newer ECG patterns like especially in the V1, V2 like the, there is fusion complex with the increased or dominant R wave which is independent of the QRS duration. In fact, okay. Similarly, there is QR, QS pattern with the QRS normalization and the QS pattern with the increased QS, QRS duration as well. So, these are really uh, important and beneficial parameters. So, are there any questions? Are there any questions so far? So to summarize, I hope you would have understood why this special type of uh, a pacemaker, which is like a CRT, cardiac resynchronization therapy, is is advised according to the guidelines for the heart failure patients. That is the first. The indications we all should know. Uh, if you see a classical QRS more than 150 milliseconds, left bundle branch block. Q, uh, and symptomatic patients as well, LV ejection fraction more, less than 35%, they are the classical indications for su such patients you should try to do. Do you understand? So, yeah, similarly, you should try to, whenever those patients come for the follow-up as well, you should try to see for the echo as well. I will try to show you more details possibly in the next session, you know. But uh, you can try to do do a ECG and on the basis of ECG as well, how are you going to do a optimization of the CRT device as well? For example, rather than biventricular pacing, if it is doing only RV pacing, if it is doing only LV pacing, how does it change as well? So these are something really important parameters we all should try to focus upon. We should try to 
see when those patients are there. Okay. So are there any questions so far? So why I've been telling this C ECG or try to focus or also on CRTD as well, like they are those patients mostly you can do the fo good follow-up, the chest x-ray or even with the ECG itself. So ECG is really, really big clue what or how these patients are going to come up. So really important. Do you understand? So are there any questions so far? Okay. So if there are no 